Yazoo, don't go. Now, I don't know how this next bit of the show's going to go. So uh, bear with me, it could all end up horribly because uh, my gran hated my next guest. She described him as dirty. I didn't fight fair. He was a cheat. Why does he always wear a mask? And why is he so horrible to Big Daddy? I'm hoping he'll take that as a compliment because even though he's in his 80s, I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. He says he's still as fit as a butcher's dog. Through the late 70s and 80s, he was a key part of ITV's schedule. Four o'clock, Saturday afternoon, 14 million of us would sit down and watch the wrestling, me and my gran among them. One of the biggest names in the ring, the masked figure of Kendo Nagasaki, is with me this afternoon. That could finish Bronson completely in this bout. Like I say, it's off. Like I said, his mask off. There he is now. We've seen him for the first time. An extraordinary fit. What an extraordinary hairstyle. What's happening in front there? That's what he looks like. Kendo Nagasaki, for the first time ever, has been demasked. Kendo Nagasaki wore a mask, uh, carried a, a samurai sword, I suspect, some kind of sword as well. Uh, he's better known, you, you wouldn't recognise him, Peter Thornley is the man who was Kendo, is Kendo. I don't, he's here yeah, now, well, Peter, good afternoon. He's sort of my alter ego, yeah. Lovely to see you again. It's five years since we last had it a chat. Indeed, How are you yeah. keeping? I'm good. Training all the time, you know, keeping fit. Well, we'll get on to you going back in the ring a bit later. I just want to turn back the clock a little bit. You're still living in the Moorlands for now. When you hear that, when you hear that music, the yeah. world of sport and all the rest yeah. of it, how do you feel? Great times. Miss it. Really miss it. Yeah, I was much younger then, of course. <laughs> we all feel better when we're younger, don't we? So I enjoyed every minute of it. Did it hurt? Because, I mean, some of the stuff that was going on in the ring, some, we had uh, yeah. Andy on earlier, and we'll hear a bit from him later, talking about, he used to watch you in Croydon, talking about whether it was sport or entertainment. I mean, some of the I, stuff you were doing must have hurt. I would call it entertaining sport. I mean, the thing was, when I, when I first came to it, the, the, the punters, we call them punters, by the way, they believed it, and so did the wrestlers. So we used to, not like the Americans do now, I call the Americans strictly come dancing on steroids. But when we did it, we used to make it look more real, because a lot of the lads were actually you know, amateur wrestlers and things like that, so they could put holds on. I mean, I can put holds on now that'll make you shout. Uh, yeah, don't, don't feel you have to. I, I don't I'll take your word you for want. it. No, it's fine. Because <laughs> you, you're still involved in, in all this stuff. I mean, did, did you ever break anything? Or did you ever break anyone when you were wrestling? Well, I've, I've not really broke a few times. I've, I've had three operations on my neck. Uh, I've had uh, knee problems. But I haven't broke, not serious breaks, I haven't broken a bone in that way. Just cracked my ribs and things like that, you know. Because I'm, I'm too good to let that happen, you see. I'll get out of the way. I prefer to break bones than get mine broken. <laughs> I, I just wanted to talk to you briefly about my gran and her view of Kendo. Yes. Not, not of you, I should oh, point out. I, yeah. we're, we're all mixed up together, you know. She thought you were dirty. She thought you didn't fight fair. She thought you were a cheat. Yes. Is that, is, is that, is that normal? Ass- yeah, is that a fair assessment of well, Kendo a, Nagasaki? Well, yeah. I thought Kendo uh, did what he had to do to win. Basically, whatever it if took. People thought it was cheating, but it's it, it, part of this is entertainment. We're there to entertain, aren't we? So, Gr- Gran's reaction is good. It's exactly what we're doing. Well, I, I was talking to someone earlier and saying so much because it still gets shown occasionally. Have you seen this? They occasionally show ten minutes of it yes. on ITV Four yep. from time to time, yep. and there's so many to put it bluntly, white-haired women with handbags. Oh, yeah. Shouting like you wouldn't believe at yeah. you. What was the atmosphere like back in the day? Very, very aggressive. They were really, really... Got right into it. I mean, one night I was hit by a lady with an handbag with a brick in it. Knocked me to the floor. 
I, I thought this looked, she wasn't very old, she should be about, what, about 40, 45. I thought, well, she's not going to work, he's got an handbag. And I'm sort of posing like the big strong man I was in those days. And as I come up to her, she swung the handbag from her side, hit me in the side of the face, and my knees give way. <laughs> I grabbed the bag of her, ripped it open, and the brick fell out. So, yeah, and once when I was in Liverpool Stadium, I had a, a fountain pen stuck in my back. Uh, <clears throat> and the nib broke off and I had to go and have it removed. So they could be quite nasty. And a guy on, on, on crutches, he had two crutches. I walked up to him as if he was all right and safe. One came off the floor like that, smacked me inside the face and put, I had to go on about four stitches in my face. So actually we were more injured by the audience than the wrestlers? We did get injured by the wrestlers as well. I mean, when I started, it was a much harder thing. I mean, the lads now take lots of risks with the bumps that they take. They, uh, they do a lot more high work now and some of those bumps that they take when they get up on that top rope and they come off you know you go out of the ring you're coming down 12 feet even if it's only if you've got a bit of spring in it it's still hard and you can if you fall wrong you can just do yourself a, a real mystery so there's a lot of danger in it uh there is how how did you cope and, and you'll probably say it was it never happened to me because i was too quick but how did you cope when you got like giant haystacks or big daddy coming at you these colossal Whoa. men yeah they're, they're big lads but they're, they're not they're not that dangerous because they are big because they're slow and ponderous and i mean the thing about haystacks is you know you can see the size of him <clears throat> when you let him throw you on the floor and jump on you you're in his hands because if he falls wrong you're going to have a very serious injury. So you have to rely on the fact that he's not going to do anything too stupid. You know, he jumps in the air and lands on you. Uh, hopefully he lands on his knees and his own elbows. Or And so most of his weight is taken in his own body. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to kill each other, do we? And if he was to land heavy and hurt you, he knows he's in for a receipt. Because, you know, you aren't going to let that go. Uh, I mean, when I was in it, and those, we used to call them receipts. Somebody did something you didn't like, you used to get up and give them, a, you know, have one back. We we called it a receipt. And they, they knew, they knew, and they also knew the people who could give them, give them a receipt as well. And I was one of them. Yeah, on many lists, I'm sure. <laughs> um, did you get on? Yeah, out what? of the ring and, and off stage and all the rest of it... Were some of you friends behind the scenes, or, or was there always, you know, I, I well, at th- some point this bloke's going to jump on me and injure me, potentially? I'll put it this way. I mean, certain of the lads used to mix together. I never did. I kept... I, I've never, ever socialised with wrestlers, ever. Uh, because of the character or the thing, the persona that I project, I was really sort of totally and utterly dedicated to Kendo Nagasaki. I never mixed with wrestlers. I never spoke to them if I, unless I had to. Uh, but you didn't I, speak at all for a long time, public. did you? I mean, obviously, I had to speak behind the scenes, <clears throat> as me, but once I took on that persona, that was it. Why? W- why take on the persona? It's good box office. <laughs> as simple as that? <laughs> well, I think it's, yeah, but it boils down to that, don't we? call it bums on seats, don't we? <laughs> but th- there's so much I, more I, to I, Kendo I, Nagasaki I think, than yeah. that, though, isn't there? Yeah, because, there you is. know, there, there's this whole spiritual side yeah. to it, there's, there's all the sort of meditation side right. to it and the things that you've gone on to do subsequently. I think that all built up, the, uh, the, the character was built off all that experience with Kenoshiro Abbey being a... I, I sat to the feet of the master. I sat at the feet of Kenoshiro Abbey for four years. And he... I've got Aikido one removed from Ishiba because he studied under Ishiba for 10 years. So I have Aikido one removed from the master. And so, and then I've studied under Billy Riley at Riley's gym. So I come to professional wrestling, which is what you watch on the television, from a background of a very serious business. I mean, I was a British judo champion. <coughs> I was also a weightlifting champion. And I was an excellent catch wrestler, which was submission wrestling. So when I came to the, to the business... In, in 1964, I got all this background. And I came in right at the top. I mean, most mass men, when, when, when I did it, they were old wrestlers that had already got a career behind them. I hadn't got all that. I came straight in the business, in a mask, right at the top. And I was at the top of the bill. And that's where I stayed ever since. 
Andy called earlier. I think you might have heard this on the way in because you do still live in the Moorlands. This is what Andy wanted to ask, having seen you many times over the years. We met him um, a few times, really, because we used to go backstage, by the stage door, and Big Daddy would sign autographs of the, you know, the whole time. Pat Roach wouldn't necessarily. He'd be off in his car. But Kendall would come out with George, gorgeous George. His autograph, I've got, I've got it in front of me, actually. I've got a few. It's just a mixture of um, symbols, numbers, mathematicals. And, you know, it was like T equals brackets four over line by line and then you'd sign it at the end for for me when i'm 13 you know my brother's 15 for the next sort of like 20 years we looked at this and thought what does it mean and we've never known what it means but he never signed it uh yeah never signed kendo or anything like that it was always just this kind of code if you like the other thing was i remember him it was 1977, the Wolverhampton Civic Hall. It was on telly and he unmasked. 14 million people were watching it on telly. So there was a theory that when he unmasked, the mystery sort of went. And then he just became this sort of, you know, sort of bald-headed man with what appeared to have been red contact lenses. And he's got the star tattoo on his head. So he wrestled for a while unmasked. And I just wonder if, if he regrets that now because... Yeah, when he unmasked, the mystery sort of went, and then he just sort of like, oh, that's what he looks like. And then, and I just wonder if he regrets the unmasking quite early on in his career in 1977. You've brought in, um, and thank you, brought in a, a picture done by Peter Blake yes, of, of a good. character yep. based on the, the kendo mask, yes, indeed. which you've signed for us, which is is lovely. Andy's point there, I thought, well, maybe it was just a load of random things that you just write down and yeah, give to people. Sure. It, it, it's not, because what you've <coughs> given me matches completely what Andy was talking yeah, about. Yeah. That's Kendo's signature. That's Kendo's signature. Well, it what says, is it? If you look at it, if you look at the, that says, Ken, because you read it the other way around in Japanese, Kendo Nagasaki. Whenever you see that symbol there, that means Do, which means way. So it's the way of the sword, Kendo. And that's the, Nagasaki is the town in Japan, of course, or the district. So it actually says Kendo Nagasaki. So it is Japanese? Absolutely, yeah. Do you speak Japanese? Uh, a little tiny bit, but not a lot. But when, when, I, when I decided to go professional wrestling, I'd already... Kenoshiro Abbey, I've spoken to you about Kenoshiro. He was an eighth dan judo, uh, a sixth dan aikido, and a sixth dan kendo. And he was, wanted me to train to go to the Olympic Games in 1964. He was training me to go to the Olympic Games. But unfortunately, I lost this finger about two years before. And that really took that away from me. But it's difficult to do holds, I would have thought. Was it? Or well, more it, difficult if you've lost half a, a It isn't finger. so much now, but when you, when you first lose it, because I got septicemia, it was very painful, very sore. I was about probably about four months before I could really get to grips the thing again. But I, I decided by then that I was going to go to professional wrestling and not stay down the amateur track because I decided I want to make some money. And Kenoshiro, that signature, although Kenoshiro disapproved of me doing that, I went to see him in his flat in, in, in London and he had birds and, and animals all over them. He had birds flying in and out and a rabbit in, on the floor. And even though he didn't want me to do it, he showed me how to do that signature. And he wrote it on the back of an application form for Aikido. And I've still got that signature this day in my collection where Kenoshiro did it in his own hand. And when he graded me first Dan, because uh, I won, I won the the, the the judo championships. I was a brown belt, and I, be, I beat a third dan, and he created me up immediately from a brown belt. From a brown belt, yeah. Wow! And I beat a third dan to get the championships, the BJC championships. That's like going up what four or five grades, something it's, like that. It's more than that because uh, if you go from brown belt to to, to third dan, you you you're going a long way. Yeah. Wow. You, you're probably taking ten years. So I beat this, and and, and when he when I did that, he did, he did. A, a certificate in his own hand in what we call kanji that's japanese writing and when he presented it to me he said for a very special student i do myself and he gave me this certificate it's about that size and it's all in his own hand it says on the left hand side kenneth yorobe dan peter thornley first dan and that's in my office now is that one of your proudest moments i it is indeed yeah and it's not just that it's also because this guy thought I was special, I thought he must be right. And I've been special ever since. We'll get on to that in a moment. Peter Thornley with us on BBC Radio Stoke. You might know him as Kendo Nagasaki. More to come next. 
Doobie Brothers, listen to the music. Just have a fascinating chat off the radio with Peter Thornley, uh, the man who was and is, and uh, I suspect always will be in some way, Kendo Nagasaki. Yeah. <laughs> Still am, <laughs> definitely. Um, uh, th- we didn't answer Andy's question about you being unmasked at, at the Civic in Wolverhampton in 1974. Did you regret that? And did that take away some of the mystery and the mystique? No, I, I never regretted it at all. It was, it was the right thing to do at the time, and, it, and I don't think it uh, diminished the mystery because I then I retired. I wrestled in, without the mask for probably about three or four months. Then I retired for eight years. I went into the pop business, would you believe? You were a manager, weren't you? I managed to, I had a recording studio, managed studios, and, and did all sorts of things. When Peter Stringfellow bought the talk of the town and turned it into the my organisation put all the acts in there. Uh, and we had di- a disco diva on the road called Laura Palace, and she did all the gay clubs. Uh, and when he opened his, he had a Monday night and he opened his a gay thing, we were we organised it all for him. That, I mean, since, since you raise sexuality, I want to ask you about yeah. yours and, and the story that, that you came out and it came out uh, yes. years ago now. Yeah. But what was it like being bisexual and, uh, and a wrestler? Did you know at the time or, or was it something... Did I know you... I was a wrestler, you mean? No, did, <laughs> what, did you? <laughs> other people knew you were a wrestler because they were terrified of you. I definitely knew I was a wrestler. Did you know you were bisexual? I, the thing is, <clears throat> the bisexuality really, if you, if you study my generation... I mean, I was born in 1941. I mean, we've got Alan Turing just after that, and we you know, you know, having to. That was illegal. Bite, bite of the apple. When I was 17, two people who I went to school with, in a, a year older than me, went to prison for, you know, for uh, sexual acts. And I'm thinking, well, there, but for the grace of God, go I. So I would say that. Bisexuality is forced on my type of person because society does not allow you to be who you really want to be. So I would actually say when I really, really think about it, I'm absolutely honest with myself, that my bisexuality is... I've been pushed into that sort of thing. I would have... If, I, if it had been now, I would be gay. I wouldn't be bisexual. Where because does that leave your marriage then? Because you were married for I was, years. Yeah, I, was, but I was married to a much uh, an older lady. We got married be- for company, not for sex. Uh, and she knew all about my. I mean, I'd know i know my wife. I know my wife for ten years before we actually married, and we, we. She really. I was going through a funny period in in the eighties. Uh, I was. Managing bands, I was in the pop business. I mean, I, I suppose I had a great lifestyle, really, because I had loads of money. I mean, I went to go and see Phantom of the Osprey on Broadway. I just got on Concord and went and saw it. Didn't think anything about spending the money, <clears throat> and, and we and flew back in a day. And plus, it, it was uh, what was the name of the guy that was in it? The the one that did it here. He was he was just about to finish. Michael Crawford. He was still in Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. I thought I've got to go and see this, so I just. Went on Concord, saw it and came back the next day. With George and myself both went. So money wasn't a problem. I mean, I had a, a big fancy house, a Rolls Royce parked in the guy. But I was going to, going to pieces with the things that were going on around me at the time because I was in the pop business, the drugs and all sorts. Of it. And, and my wife really saved me from that. And eventually we, I got away from it all by buying this house in, Mo, in Moorcourt, Oakamore. And that really sort of was another phase of my life, changed me completely. I got away from all that nonsense that was going on in London. I mean, George died of AIDS in 1988. I bought more Cordor and I just had to get away because London was... If I'd have stayed in London, I'd have been dead by now. So where you are at the moment in Okamore is a retreat. I, I read an article in a Japanese magazine. Yes. Someone had translated it, thankfully. Um, cool. But I, I read an article about uh, someone being uh, brought to meet you to talk about, you know, the, yes. the Japanese influences yes, on your indeed. life and describing it as a retreat. What you're telling me here is it was a retreat for you in the first to instance. Start with, yeah. To get away from well, it all. When I first bought more court all, the idea was to, to turn it into flats because I had lots of friends back in London that wanted... We weekend place to, to go to get away from it all it's a big house it's got 50 odd rooms in it and I was going to turn it into flats but I bought it and I was sort of toying with what I was going to do here there and ever and I met another lady walked into my life called Yvonne Walker and she had this idea that she wanted to open a home for people with learning disabilities 
And we talked and talked and talked. And in the end, I was persuaded that that was a, the right way to go. And we opened it home. We, we bought a, a, another building on the estate that I live on. It was, it's was got 25 bedrooms in it. And we turned that into our first care home. Then we turned more court all, all in. We bought other houses. We ended up holding most of the estate. We had about, I think we had about 70 people living on that estate. Then we bought a big place in Utoxeter. We were caring for about 150, 200 people at one stage. Did the it, people that there know that it was Kendo Nagasaki who was behind all this? People, people close to me did, yeah. Yeah. But the people living in, in the care homes? No, the, the, the clients <laughs> thinking, didn't. The clients didn't wasn't, no. You didn't brand it Kendo, no, no, did you or anything? No, there was nothing. I completely stepped away from Kendo at that stage. I mean, and and even, I mean, even then, although I was, by that time I'm gay and I've got a boyfriend, let's put it that way, people didn't even know then because I don't present as being gay. I mean, I can get away with being straight. <laughs> Well, Let's call it straight for the well, of the I, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Gorgeous George as yes. well, who um, I, I think you could describe, certainly in terms of the on-stage, in the ring yes. persona, as high camp, at the very the, least. Yeah. Um, what was your relationship with him like? Well, we were very, very close friends. We were never sexual partners in any way, shape or form. When I first met George in the Wimpy Bar in Earl's Court, he did fancy me. I was quite attractive in those days. <laughs> well, we didn't know because you got a mask on I'm half the time. I didn't have it on that, that, that night. And that's how I got to meet him. If you look on my website, you can see how we, it all begins. Uh, and I got to meet him. He got talking to me and slowly became friends. And then George slowly, he was, he was living in Girls Court, not doing anything. He was just, I, I suppose he was just there. He'd got a few quid and he'd retired and just enjoying himself. But it... Eventually, he got into financial trouble. Things got worse and worse and worse. And eventually, he, 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 I decided I'd bring him into the management thing. But I'd known him. By the time I brought him to be my manager, I'd known him for three years. So I, I, I didn't uh, rush into that. How would you describe your relationship with Kendo? Do you see it that way? Or are, are, is no, Kendo I, I, part I think, of you and I, are you think, part of him? No, I think Kendo is a separate entity. I don't sort of bring Kendo into my life in that way. I, I do have a separate existence from Kendo. Kendo is a, an iconic image, isn't it? I mean, you can't live like that, can you, all the time? <laughs> is, is he a character, or would it be unfair to describe him in that way? In, in, the, in a way, if, if, you, if you take wrestling as entertainment rather than yes. sport, was he your stage persona, your character, or was there more to it than that? Because, like I say, so much of the spiritual side of it and, and the, the, the kind of um, ways of thinking yes. that support Kendo yeah. seem to have come into your everyday life as well. Yeah, it does. Well, that all came in because of Kenneshiro Abbey. I mean, Kenneshiro Abbey taught me Zen, <clears throat> which is a form of Buddhism. And I'd, I'd meditated ever since I knew Kenneshiro. I still do now, twice a day. Uh, and so that built into that. So Ken, Kendo Nagasaki is part of that, but it's also a separate part. I can sort of flick it off and on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so you're going back in the ring. Yes. You're in your 80s. 83. I have to say, 83, <laughs> ne nearly 84? No, I'm, I'm 83 this year. In, in about A couple of weeks' time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You've got it. Um why on earth would a nearly 83-year-old man want... Well, nearly 84-year-old man want to go in the ring? Because I can. Are you, I'm going to ask you this. We were talking about ageism earlier, and I'm, I don't want to be ageist with you, Peter, but are you fit enough? You look it, I have to say. Would you want to try me out? No, that's what I mean. <laughs> you look it, and I'm quite happy with that. You're clearly satisfied, because the, yeah. the guys you're taking on are 50, 60 years younger than you. Possibly, yeah, but you... Uh, I mean, I've gone to various clubs and uh, what, they, what they learn nowadays is what we call show wrestling. They do what you see on the television, don't they? They don't know catch wrestling. Very fair. I can show them, even now I can go into a gym and say, come here, let me show you this and they haven't got a clue what's happening to them. I can get them in, the, in a hold and just a little tweak here and there and they don't know what's happened. And, they'll, and they, they're shocked. And that's happened time and time again. You'd be surprised how few of these people that do what we call professional wrestling. And even in my day, it's a limited number that actually knew how to say, 
put these real serious holes on. I can put an hole on it that you'll, you'll just scream the house down. Uh, Please don't. No, I won't do it today, but I can do. And these people know that, don't they? And they, 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 even now they're wary of me. I was going to say, are you worried you might hurt them? No. <laughs> I'm not going to let them hurt me, either. <laughs> Why are you doing it, though? I mean, you say because you can. There's got to be well, more to it than I, that, I surely. I'm a, I'm a record breaker, aren't I? I mean, I've, I've had this 60-year career. I started wrestling on Friday the 13th of November 1964. I've done my career will be 60 years young. Young. <laughs> Notice they said 60 yeah. years young, <laughs> not 60 years old. And and I'll be 83, so I'm breaking records. And the, and the, the, what they call they don't call it the Guinness Book of Records, and they call it Guin- Guinness, Guinness World, World records, records. Yeah. So I'm breaking those two records. So I want to go in the record book, don't I? Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't want? If you can do it, why not do it? Who's going? If somebody comes behind me and says they can do better, let's see. Aside from that, do you think you've done everything you wanted to do, and everything that you know when you first started? Yeah, when you first started as a young wrestler, coming over from judo and aikido and things. Yeah, have you achieved what you aim to? I've had a good, I've had a good career. It isn't over yet, though. I'm still at it, (laughs) enjoying every minute of it. How do you keep fit? Train. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't smoke and I don't drink. I, I mean, I, I perhaps have a, a glass of wine at Christmas somewhere, but I'm a, I don't drink. Uh, although I own a, a, the biggest gay hotel in Blackpool, and we sell alcohol and things like that, I personally don't drink. Uh, I mean, I've owned that hotel for, since 2005. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I don't drink and I don't smoke, and I train at least every day. I do at least three quarters of an hour every day. I've got the gym at home where all my equipment and everything, I do that. Sometimes I do a bit longer, depends. But I, I, I never fail doing training. And I've done that all my life. It's just a habit. It's like walking down the stairs, I just do it. You know, you, just, you don't think about it. But the Japanese call it doing not doing. When you're doing not doing, everything gets done. So I do not doing, so I just do these things. And boot to do. And that's how you wrestle as well. You, you wrestle with an intuitiveness. If somebody comes towards me, I don't have to think about it. I just know what to do. If you put your hand out, I don't think what I'm going to do with it. I just know. I pull you like that, and you, it's all too late. Before, you, before I'd even thought about it, I'm already, I've already done it. And that's called doing not doing. Do you think this will be it? You've got this bout coming up. You'll break the records. Is that it? Well, it depends if anybody else breaks the record. I'll have to go back again, then, won't I? <laughs> and you're doing it with the mask? With, yes, with, I'm with going all to wear the that mask that you've just been looking at. Which, interestingly, is a multicolour. I mean, is that a pride it, mask, yeah, essentially? It, it's the rainbow mask hmm. that the Peter, Sir Peter Blake himself has designed. Is it to do with pride or not? Well, it's the rainbow mask, the rainbow flag, the rainbow. It's the rainbow colours. It's all to do with pride, yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, how, how do you feel about the way that things are different now when it comes to sexuality? As, as you said a few moments ago, you, you would have been gay if you'd had, uh, I guess, the opportunity yeah. and it wasn't illegal. I mean, are we yeah. in a better place now? Well, I think young people are in a better place. And, yeah, and I am as well. But I still find, I still, because of all that old experience, sometimes if I meet somebody and they don't know me, and they, they perceive me as being, let's call it straight, for want of a better word. I play the part. I still do it, just out of habit. But you played that part for decades, I didn't have, you? Yeah. And it's, it's difficult to switch off. And people don't realise, and I sometimes have to say, you do know I'm gay, don't you? <laughs> really? <laughs> and are you OK with that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what would be engaged with me? <laughs> no, I mean, with, 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 with people not realising, does it, does well, it matter? It's, well, it, even? Yeah, it's, it's just the way I am, aren't I? They, they don't realise because I've put on this, this persona of... And I do that naturally. When I meet a stranger, I don't, not, I don't go up to them... And I'm, I'm not an effeminate gay person. Uh, as I say, people ask me if I'm a gay wrestler. I say, no, I'm not a gay wrestler. I'm a wrestler that's gay. There's a big difference. I don't portray myself as being a gay person, a gay wrestler, no. but I am gay. But I do lots of things that, to, you know, I wrestle, I can wrestle properly. And I, so that's where I'm coming from, really. Uh, one final question. Um, I, I've seen you selling up in Oakamore. Yes. I wish I'd got the money because it's gorgeous. Yes, nice house. Uh, uh, why? Well, I, I've got a business, in, I've got this business in Blackpool. Uh, this Your club, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, it's a big hotel, actually. It's over 50-odd room hotel. And we've got a bar and we, we, we're doing a new bistro and kitchen and everything, uh, a coffee lounge and a, a beauty salon in it and all the things. And I'm buy, buying a house down there to open another retreat. But I'm going to focus on people who... What really made my mind up, we had a, what we call a breakfast chef. who was a man in his about 60. And he didn't turn to work one day. And everybody said, well, where is he? Where is he? So eventually, about three days later, they go and find out where he's dead in his flat. Nobody cared. And I thought, well, this is an old guy that's a gay old guy, and they've got nobody. They, they, he's left there on his own. Nobody cares. Nobody. So I want to create this thing. Because I... It's all in the charities. I've set this charity up, the Kendall Nagasaki Foundation. So I want to create this thing before I finally go to the <laughs> hereafter. This place where we can create a retreat or, or a safe haven for older gay people to be there when they haven't got anybody. Because you find that gay people are very lonely, especially as they get older. Uh, they, they've not got family, they've got children, all that, that backup that most people do. I use the word straight again. Uh, have got they haven't got all that, and some of them both, particularly the older ones, they've also been pushed away by their families as well. A lot of them, so they're very lonely. And I feel that there's a big opening there, a big hole there. That I, you know, I've done well for myself, I suppose, financially and things like that. And you know, I have not neither chicken nor child. What I leave behind will be for somebody else to take care of and make sure that my wishes are carried out. And I want that to be. I want that to, my legacy to care for the people that I feel are in need. And that's what I'm doing now. Peter, it's lovely to see you again. Thanks very much it's for coming in. It's been my pleasure, in. really. Can I say good luck? I don't want to say break a leg because that's an acting thing and it's the last thing you want to do <laughs> yeah, in a couple of weeks' luck. time. Good luck. <laughs> good luck in a couple of weeks. I'll be keeping an eye on it. You're a gentleman. And you'll you. be a record breaker. Absolutely. Lovely to see you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Kendo Nagasaki. Peter with us on BBC Radio Stoke, talking about his life, talking about the next fight uh, coming up in a couple of weeks' time, um, which I will let you know how it goes. Thanks so much. Good to see you. You have them on vinyl. 